Right, so we're running early, which is fine because we'll have more time for the break. Um, next one is uh, Marcelo. So, yeah, please go. Is about um, improving um, the isolation or removing some of the sources of. Um, yeah, right there. Uh, removing some of the sources of um, interruptions. And um, so the current situation is that a number of call, there are a number of call paths which can interrupt isolated CPUs. And um, we rely on user space behaving nicely for interruptions to not occur. Um, and then this is a little off topic, maybe a little off topic um, thing, but I decided to write it either way, um, anyway. So <clears throat> that um, if you have dis uh, distinct interference sources and they align in time, then the interference on isolated CPU might sum up. And I guess that for some workloads so far, um, that was not um, considered too problematic because the consequences of violating latency are not are perhaps acceptable but um, it seems that um, for other workloads like uh, industrial uh, automation this could be a problem so it would be better to deal with them um, so this um, talk is about um, the some some of those copets um, that can generate in uh, interruptions to isolated CPUs are executed from user space and so they can return errors. And so the what we are proposing is to introduce a new CPU, CPU mask and then try to use the name interference rather than uh, interruption because interruption kind of uh, is ambiguous with uh, in IRQ interrupt, right? So, um, so it's a new CPU mask and called block interference CPU mask uh, with a bit set for the CPUs which should have such interferences blocked. Uh, and then on that, on top of that, we introduce a few variants of functions that interrupt CPUs um, with the variant checking whether the CPU is marked as block uh, interferences, interferences, so there's a typo there, uh, and returns an error. So, um, we would create um, fail variants for the family of functions that families of functions that uh, interrupt uh, CPUs, um, and this CPU mask would, uh, is to be written from user space after system initialization. So, because uh, the initialization process might require code execution on this uh, interference block at CPUs. For example, MTRR initialization, uh, resource, um, um, risk control file system initialization, which will do MSR writes and other MSR writes. So the pattern uh, that seemed natural was um, you grab a lock, uh, per CPU read write semaphore, and that was chosen because it's very cheap on read, um, then you call off the, one of those functions, the fail variant, then you unlock that per CPU read write semaphore. And if there's an error, I'm um, sorry, there's another type of error, if error at the end, then you return error to user space. Then the second pattern is where you, do, you don't want to turn to check the errors from the fun from the uh, functions that uh, generate interruptions. So you grab the lock, then you directly, um, you find this target CPU, then you check if uh, that CPU is part of this mask, of this um, blo blocked interference CPU mask, then return error to user space, then you have the code that would interrupt the CPUs, then unlock that um, per CPU read-write semaphore. Yeah, yeah. So those are the examples. Yeah. So for example, so there I, I did four on the patch set that was sent this week. There were four um, 
conversions. So one of them is a simple one, which uses the which is the first uses the first pattern. So uh, rather than calling, so this is a clock event on bind when you you do a write to a CFS file to change the clock event device. And it will get here. Um, so you grab the lock, call the the, the fail variant, which will check the CPU mask and return error if it's set, and then unlock and return the error. Okay. Um, this one was um, also on the clock subsystem, but to change clock source uh, from user space. And it becomes a little more complicated because it's called from a path where you can fail and from a path where you don't want to fail. And then you need to handle that separately. This one looked quite ugly, but I don't know if any. saying that if you're in user space, for example, you don't need stop machine could skip those. I don't get it. So what I understand is that stop machine will call, uh, will interrupt all CPUs on the system with the function that. So when you when you um, you do right. So um, so yeah, the thing is in under this um, if you follow this code path, T clock notify will call. We end up yeah. So it's calling stop machine. So I'm not sure the point really, Frederick. Because do you mean that we could change this this to use something else other than stop machine? No, 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 I mean... So you're saying that yeah, user space should not try to change the clock source? But then it doesn't know so user space is an exposed an interface and it doesn't know which things do what, right? Yeah. Um Yeah, so I we, know that's how, requires how how would we this is a way to avoid like to you ensure by having this code that even if user space calls the clocks are changed. This is a, like a bad example, really. But maybe um, I can give you another example, other examples that you don't have control of all of user space, maybe, or you don't have control of if someone logs into the machine, that's, then you're going to say, it's difficult, I guess, to have a system where you log in and can only run those and those things, right? Mm -hmm. There are situations where people end up doing things um, and you want to have some sort of guarantee that the CPUs will not be interrupted, right? Okay, but yeah, I see what you mean, but I really think that uh, user space workloads involving isolation really need to, to uh, comply to some basic things not to do. Oh, I see your point. That would be a nice thing, but 
Yeah, that um, would be nice. Yeah, I know. yeah. <laughs> it, it would be nice if it happened, but people want to, um, you know, they have their, like Edge, for example, they have their machine and at the Edge, and they have a single one, and so they need to run some applications on the system that's running isolated uh, applications as well. And then, if you want that, so you're going to say, you could say, okay, don't run anything. This is a special type of system. I don't want anything else to run there, but it becomes difficult to do that, right? You have to have people know about this and then there's a special system that you have. It's not like, oh, okay, I can log into the system as any system and run things, etc. Go ahead. Okay. Does it work? Okay. So I think that the case that Marcelo is, is mentioning are those systems that use uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift, where you can have a, a multiple types of workloads, and one is not necessarily aware of the other. And uh, and so in this case, is it it, it it happens. So it happens to have a workload that's not aware of that CPU isolation, and and even these workloads with CPU isolation they come and go dynamically. So that that that's why Marcelo is is trying to refer to this. To this case, yes. that, that's his use case. That's an example where I, I think it's easier to do this in a centralized location than to change a just to uh, change a way to interact with. The system. One yeah. one question: Why? So this is called when you are changing your clock source, and the previous one was when you are changing clock event. How you want to change your clock source if you want to be isolated and not disturbed by anything else? Yeah, this, from the beginning, I would say. This example is more of um, this one is m more of like an example because you don't you wouldn't normally do that. Yeah, but that's my you, point. MSI reads people do, and we've seen on the field, and so this is just um, maybe examples on the usage of the API, but which is not realistic. Like you, you couldn't think of any case where someone would do that, and neither do I. But um, there are other cases where the following examples. So. Okay, yeah, maybe the next, the next one. one. Um, <clears throat> so perf, for example, so you're attaching a perf. Um, uh, context to, um, to a CPU uh, or to a task, and then the task is running on a CPU. And maybe this could happen by, uh, by an accident, let's say, right? Um, and if you block it, then this is one, one uh, example which is more realistic. There are other ones as well. And, um, so this would be uh, the part. I don't know where where this is in perf. Uh, what, what? This is the perf um, event open or open event. Okay. System, so yeah. Where you're creating a perf um, context. I don't know, uh, yeah, yeah. It's to monitor creates a perf, perf event. event. And and then you have to interrupt um, the CPUs to maybe, I oh, think, um, right. enable uh, the triggering of uh, mm -hmm. the monitoring of the performance uh, architecture row events. And then you do that through an API. Yeah. Um, so, in in this case, I just uh, just changed the case where there is no task, so the person has to pass a mask with a CPU perf minus C. And then you would say, okay, if you knew, if you're aware that this system has isolated applications and even CPUs, you wouldn't never do that. But people might do that, or this applications might end up doing that for some reason or another. And we want to block that. So that's just the pattern too. So it's checking uh, before uh, it grabs the, the per CPU rewrite some effort, then um, Checks all CPUs that it's going to send IPIs, and if there's any one of them set in the mask, um, it returns an error. And the other one uh, that is perhaps more um, well, this one we haven't seen in production, but um, if you do write to program TRR, which happens when Yes, when you're uh, starting the X server, for example, maybe there are other uh, situations. Um, then the same pattern too, you check 
uh, if uh, any um, online CPU, because it's going to interrupt all um, online CPUs. So if any online CPU is on the also blocked uh, interference uh, CPU, then we return our and then again, there's um, um, other cases like MSR rights and that we see in production MSR rights um, or changing things like CPU frequency or locking CPU frequency. And there's also WBIVD, which is uh, caching validation. Um, which happens on some um, footpaths in the, in, with graphics card. I haven't looked deeply into those, and I don't know exactly when they can happen. But I know that at least they can happen on initialization of graphics cards. Uh, yeah. So uh, one thing that was not clear and that looked quite hacky was the location of the CPU mask to be exposed to user space. And currently, is in the, the bugfs for the pad set that connects with your previous with the previous uh, talk. So there was a location to maybe a more official location to uh, have uh, this kind of um, uh, interface exposed to user space. It would be nice. And yeah, so that's about it. And I was wondering if anyone has any. Other comments? Uh, I guess it could be integrated into the housekeeping stuff. Which uh, so I know that there is uh, the issue that during the initial initialization you don't want to to to, to work, work, but only work. after initialization, right? Yes. But I guess we can do that with housekeeping. I mean, having that CPU mask exposed with the rest. In the CPU set, for example. Right, but um, unless it, it should be this initialization, you were thinking it needs to be user space controlled. Like, for example, this MSR rights that you might want to do on a CPU or MTRR rights, um, you would do it. It's not like late in its call time, but at some user space triggerable. I'm not sure if this has... And this is not something that a user space could tune using CPU sets? Sure. Yeah. Um, as long as it can tune it at a given yeah. point in time that it uses, then it could be CPU, uh, CPU sets. But, and then also it's kind of weird to have it as a separate, should it be a separate thing the CPU mask, or maybe just along with our human no callbacks, or yeah, I don't know. It's you know. I think it can be go with the rest. There may be a whole CPU mask for all the uh, isolation features in the end, especially if we modify it through CPU sets in one go. Then mm -hmm. let's just have one CPU mask for everything. Yeah, but then you would need um, some other uh, user space triggerable or writable uh, interface to enable this, right? Like, you use the CPU mask that is being used for by isolation, but this feature is disabled until someone writes, enables it, you see. Oh, so there are cases where this feature could be disabled while having the rest of the isolation yes. running. Oh, okay. But I don't think, I don't see any use for disabling it on runtime. It's just that this thing um, you might need to 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 um, interfere with this uh, isolated CPUs. For example, if you want to do REST control file system initialization, you write some MSRs there, like you set up the cache. Um, reservation and everything in user space, and then that will generate uh, IPIs or queue work, uh, IPIs, and then you want that, you want to allow that, right? But then after this is done, you block it, block any further um, 
APIs from the MSR or any of those paths for the paths that can return errors. I just wanted to point out regarding the earlier claim of user space just shouldn't do this. Um, while we all might like uh, user space to be perfect, bugs do happen, and it's nicer to see a uh, an error message than to just have latency spikes show up ramp that are hard to debug. Um, and uh, you know, isolation parameters are easier to uh, audit uh, than the entirety of your code base. Yeah, exactly. Um, is it working? Yeah. I, I think I mean um, it's uh, it's a general question. I guess I mean if. If we introduce this um, current application, we'll basically see errors reported when I try to do stuff that, that, that was working before, right? Uh, okay. So my question would be, how do you expect uh, those, uh, I mean, current app would adapt to this, this fact that, that maybe that's from a, one day to another, they cannot really... That's a good question. Um, but we maybe see failures like, um, Something will fail on the system and it will stop working, right? Something will come, someone down the chain will complain that something is not working. But you prioritized, and I, I don't know, I also wonder what kind of things will happen. And I hope that there's nothing uh, bad can happen, but I don't think so. And then you'll have to address that issue, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess the follow-up question would be... So, for example, let's so let's just try to think of an example. Um, maybe, like, resource control file system. The setup, <clears throat> so you set up a mask. And one of those failures might be, like, you get another, you get um, latency violations. For example, there is the cache, the resource control. If you don't check for errors in your initialization scripts, then um, they will fail. The initialization will fail, but you have a system that doesn't have cache um, allocation done properly, which causes the uh, latency uh, failure. Yeah. So. Yeah, and uh, I guess as a follow up, I would actually wonder what sort of information uh, so about why uh, something is failing is getting back to the application so I don't know in, 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 I mean for what we are seeing basically I guess what we usually do is that okay we realize that there is I don't know an API uh, serviced by an isolated CPU and, and then we go and track what basically generated that thing so I was wondering if uh, useful addition to this uh, might be like uh, I don't know like a debug or more like verbose mode where uh, we can actually give back the application in some way uh, what actually caused the the failure so that that right. can be fixed right yeah I was thinking of adding a print K maybe you know print K this if so if you have a um, Return an error due to this uh, CPU being on CPU mask on a, the block interference CPU mask. Then you do a print K, but then I thought about um, you know, uh, logs getting filled. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. that thought. Yeah, I have a question. Um, if you are able to block IPI, for instance, there are some critical IPI like uh, when you change. Uh, the, um, the page mapping, uh, you usually need to send an IPI to the other CPU to flush the TLB and load the new one. Yes. If the, the other CPU can't do that, uh, it may yeah. crash the system. So the thing is, we you, the idea is to convert the sites that can return errors with this. So then uh, the ones that you can't, that you can't, uh, Oh, so so fail. you allow some important call to not allow to fail. They always yes. pass through, right? Okay. Yes. The 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 SMP call function single interface continues the same. If you don't change it, you get yeah. Mm -hmm. But maybe I guess it's like maybe thirty percent of the SMP call function uh, sites can be converted. Mm -hmm. So you still have a lot of them that. You need to think about maybe one uh, case by case basis, right? Mm -hmm. To 
So uh, that means it, it did not actually block the interference, it just reduced the interference, right? Sorry, can you repeat that? Because you allow some to uh, go full and some block, or block the other one, that means you, you partially block some of the, the interference, but not actually eliminate them all, right? Not all, no. Okay. It's, yeah, because it's, the, you use the word block, it seems like you are blocking all. Yes, that way the block name is like a bad name. Yeah. Can you think of a better name? Maybe. Um, yeah. Housekeeping is not confusing at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's a confusing name. I agree. So I don't know what a better name would be. But um, like selectively. Yeah. Maybe selectively, use the word reduce uh, interference or something like that. Selectively block? Reduce, reduce some of the interference, but not, not block all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So selectively block may be a, a better, yeah, more yeah, yeah, uh, so meaningful name, you know? What would be useful as well is either some kind of a tunable or maybe a BPF script or something like this. So when you run it or you enable the tunable, you would get extra log message, which would tell you if one of those paths which can interrupt an isolated CPU was triggered, and if it was, especially from user space, what was the application P's name and so on. Because yeah, right. that's the issue we have quite often when we deal with this interruption, we end up chasing, I mean, what was it caused by? Right. And if you're already identifying all of the paths, but I mean, I don't know, says CTL, and then you can just go to a log and check like, oh, this, this is the app which used this syscall or whatever, which yes. caused the interruption, that would be great. Right, exactly, yeah. So we, we thought of that too, and we wrote a tool, and it's called, uh, RT-trace-BPF, if you look it up, um, that does that, and you get a backtrace as well of the task that's interrupting, uh, and it's, you know, helpful, because that's you don't have to do all the tracing and everything, but it should be perhaps integrated into the kernel, so you would have seen it already, you know, um, yeah. And um, what about the, um, uh, so there was an idea to delay uh, the SMP call single function uh, until a task comes back to the kernel. Yeah. Uh, so what about that? That maybe could be an alternative to... Uh... Yeah, so I think for, uh, for some of the interruptions like the TOB flush... It doesn't work everywhere, of course. Yes, yeah. So it unfortunately the the person who was working on that Nicholas he's um, moved uh, changed companies so we need to get his patch set which still is um, maybe uh, has some th things to be fixed and tested and finished and then send that patch set but yeah so a person would be working on that but he moved Let's see how many colors we can uh convert to to that delayed api and see then the rest i don't i don't think any other well the ones that we can think of is the tob flush right makes sense for uh kernel addresses then the code patching right uh and maybe anything that would be used by after, anything they would use when you enter the kernel, I suppose, but anything might be a hard word, I don't know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess the cases that are there, are the, uh, the cases that are there, the QB flush and the code rights are the ones that are seen most on traces when you run like a stress application alongside the isolated one. So, yeah. I mean, another related question. So when you enable this feature and for some of the calls, you end up returning an error, which you didn't in the past. Yes. What could be useful is, I mean, log message, maybe if you enable it, but what could be useful is have some, some kind of a static BPF probe 
a single probe you could attach and get an information every time you return an error because this is enabled and which application was trying to. Can you repeat that? I, so so when, you enable, when you enable this feature, right? Yes. And you start returning errors now for some of the calls. Okay. What would be useful, I think, is if you could provide a static DPF probe, a single a single probe, essentially a hook, if you like. Yeah. So when you so you could very easily trace which applications are now failing and because of what call. All right. Yes. Or now that you've done it, you mentioned maybe um, trace points, right? Like yeah. trace fail. Um, exactly. You know. Yeah. Trace point that. It's much better than a print key. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. That would, would make life way easier to trace down those applications and see what exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. What I had to present. Any other thoughts or comments? Questions? If not, thank you, Marcel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the